Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Sunday, and on Sundays uh, we've been doing character studies. Uh, if you have not seen the previous episodes, I, I hope you will go back and watch them. They're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So far, we've studied, um, we try to take them on in, in uh, chronological order as they appear in the scriptures, and we're looking at the most um, significant um, characters in the scriptures. We've talked about Adam and Eve. Uh, we talked about Satan. Uh, we've, we've studied um, uh, Noah, uh, and we studied Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and Joseph, uh, and, and now we're studying Job. Uh, we've already done 13 chapters on Job, so today we're going to pick up where I left off last time with chapter 14 in the book of Job. So if you haven't seen these, I hope you go back and watch them, uh, but uh, we'll try to uh, present this in a way so that you still get the general context of the whole story of Job. Uh, but before we get started, I want Brother Bill to say hi, introduce himself. Yeah, hello, I'm Bill, and I'm actually under my official name bill cuthbert because there was a lot of confusion between the panda man and the panda man formerly evangelist so i thought i'm going to make it easy i'm going to have panda man evangelist for my evangelism videos and everything else i'm just going to be known as bill cuthbert uh, i also like to apologize because i have a sense of humor that and i hope that my my icon doesn't offend you all right it's death and just for laughs and giggles you know, us Christians have got a sense of humour. We're not all, you know, fuddy duddies and dry religious people. So that's me in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Uh, if um, if you're not familiar with uh, Bill Cuthbert, and I will, I'll just refer to him as Brother Bill, but uh, I, I hope you will uh, subscribe to his channel, Bill Cuthbert. And his other channels, uh, he's got numerous ones, but I guess the most prominent is a the Panda Man Evangelist. Um, and um, he, he spends a lot of his time uh, doing personal evangelism uh, directly with people, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, uh, preaching in the streets, and evangelism on YouTube. And Brother Bill and I both have this in common, that our, our, our calling, our, our ministry, uh, is primarily to tell people the good news about Jesus and how to receive the free gift of eternal life. But we like to study the whole scriptures. Um, you know, I've read the whole Bible from cover to cover numerous times, and I've studied it thoroughly for 29 years. And uh, so we do find it fascinating to even get into other theological subjects and, and discuss all the characters in the scriptures, um, even if it's not always talking about uh uh, salvation and uh, uh, you know evangelism but uh, the evangelism is the area that we focus on primarily and that is of the utmost importance okay we're gonna uh, brother Bill I, I don't know how uh, how much you've uh, you've missed uh, as far as uh, the last few episodes I've done here but Maybe you can take a, a stab at just kind of laying the foundation on the book of Job before we get started. And, you know, we have Job being afflicted by Satan and, 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 then, and then his friends coming to uh, so-called friends. I keep referring to them as so-called friends because with, with friends like that, you don't need enemies. Uh, they kind of remind me of some of my so-called friends on YouTube. But... Uh, uh, give a little general uh, background on it, and then we're going to pick up here in chapter 14. Yeah, yeah, as you know, we've got the general background so far is that, that you know, Satan, you know, came before God, you know, and, and he was being haughty, trying to express that, you know, people only worship him because, you know, he, he feeds them well, clothes them well, blesses them. And he was tempting God. So God basically said, well, no, Job loves me and believes me just because of me, sort of thing. And, you know, for all these trials and things that Job went through, you know, Job was still steadfast. He still loved God. Didn't know what on earth was going on, as, as, as we read, and we still find out. And unfortunately, his friends, in, in modern day circles, I suppose they'd be called religious. 
they're always trying to blame the person, the victim in this situation, for all the calamity that was going on. When in actual fact, it, it, in that sense, Job was blameless. Not blameless that he's sinless perfect, no one is. But he was blameless in regard to why all this calamity came upon him. And, you know, it's a lot of things you can draw out of this, a lot of truths. And you can even draw out the fact that even today, within perverse religious, you know, circles, you know, if someone is ill, they've got cancer or they're afflicted somehow, many religious people today would even say, well, it's because you're a sinner, that's because you've done something wrong in the past. You know, that's not how God works. You know, that is not the God we love and serve. And, and we see this clearly as we go more through the book of Job. But, you know, that, that is how we are so far. So I pray that you'd be blessed with what's more to come. And, and obviously the finale, you know, that all, all pans out in the end and you know exactly what happens at the end. All right, brother. Uh, uh, it's, it's my... Uh kind of a system or method that I use uh, to study the Bible is I, I look at the King James translation first. Uh, for many, many years, I was a strong advocate of KJV onlyism. And then over the last few years, I've moved away from that. And uh, I, I like to look at other translations, but I, I still will look at the King James translation first. Um, Brother Joe Byron, many of you may uh, know and remember him, he hasn't been active on YouTube for a little while, but he's uh, he referred to me as a KJV firstist. He's very good at just, you know, synthesizing things down to a simple term. So that's what I am, a KJV firstist. Let's look at the KJV first, but uh, we may end up having to look at other translations. I'm, I look at the Amplified quite often because it, it amplifies, it expounds, or it's almost like reading a scripture with commentary. All right, so chapter 14, verse 1 in the KJV. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth, forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. And doth thou open thine eyes upon such a one and bringeth me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as a hireling his day. For there is hope of a tree if it be cut down that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of, it, of water it will bud, and bring forth boughs like a plant. But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, so man lieth down and riseth not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, the, the, these chapters in Job are kind of like a long, um, uh, it's almost like a person... Um, uh, making a, a a a speech it's it's not it, it's not like he's going to say one statement and then and then there's a conversation one it's quite a long speech that he's making and so there's a a lot that you need to to cover in terms to get in the whole context of it but we're going to go through it verse by verse but first brother bill let me just let me get your reaction to what we've read so far Actually, what, what, what I found point and what we've just read is verse 7, where it says, For there is hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. And, you know, straight away what came to mind there was obviously the hope in this and God's compassion 
and mercy towards even us as sinners. And Isaiah 42 3 came straight to mind. And that basically says, it says, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. And that's speaking to me of Job's situation where he's at his, you know, his lowest point. You know, he's literally at the mercy of God. You know, and he's certainly a bruised reed and a smoking flax at this point. And, and God will show mercy and compassion and love towards that sort of, you know, sort of situation. So that's that's what really I found poignant throughout what we just read. Okay, well, we're going to go through it uh, like a verse at a time here and, and really break it down. But but overall, my impression of it was it's 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 just showing the fatality of man's situation is that uh, it's it's like what I've read in in uh, in James when he says life is like a vapor it appears for a short time and then it's gone and, and uh, throughout the scriptures we're we're reminded of the frailty and the uh, um, ter terminal condition of man and that it, it's it we only get as it says three score and ten we get 70 years now some people have a little more some people have a less but um, man's time is uh, as it says there God knows before we're even born you know everything that's going to happen and that uh, how long we're going to live and the the day that uh, said it is appointed for man to die once and then the judgment so it, it's it's really very fatalistic uh, and some people could think it's depressing and it would be depressing uh, to many people if if they were not privy to the gospel the, the good news that we can have eternal life uh, after we die we will look forward to the resurrection uh, into life everlasting uh, because of our faith in Jesus Christ so I'm going to go through one verse at a time but first just get your, your reaction to that and then we'll move on brother yeah, yeah, I agree, and, and and like I said, when we when we hit, you know, verse four, you know, that that really starts hitting home. But yeah, carry on. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to the um, look at it in the Amplified, and you've got the KJV right there too. Uh, in front of you. So as I read each verse, uh, if you think that there's anything that really stands out in the KJV that, that, that we need to show a contrast, then, then, then we'll then read that and we'll do it. But it says, verse one, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Uh, it, as much as I am um, have joy about life. I've got, I've got uh, some saints like Brother Bill and a few others that I. I it's, it brings me great joy to have fellowship with them. I've got a loving family. Um, I, I've I've had reasonably good health and, and I've had prosperity. And and I look at the creation and rejoice in the in just the beautiful skies and the mountains and everything and just see, uh, as the scripture says that the that. that the creation is a test testifies of of God that there is a God and uh, so in those ways I have a lot of joy but at the same time uh, we know I, I don't know if I was three or four or five or six or seven or, uh, at some point when I was a young boy I learned that life ends for all of us and uh, so we, we doesn't take us long to understand that, wait a second, death is waiting for each one of us. And, and we also learn through the trials and tribulations of each person's life, we learn personally about the troubles that we have to face. And, and no one gets to escape it. No one gets to go through life from beginning to end uh, if, if they live very long, unless they're like a, a child that's, uh, you know, you know, one day old, maybe they wouldn't have to deal with all these troubles and sufferings, but it's inevitable. It's, it's, uh, it's man's fate and destiny that we will suffer 
troubles in our lifetime. Uh, okay, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know it wasn't supposed to be like this. You know, from from creation. You know, we. I believe personally. I know some would deny it and and lie and and try and dismiss it. But I believe every human being has got a, a mindset or, or or a deep inkling towards eternity. You know, we, we was designed and created in the image and likeness of God to live forever. And knowing that our our days are few and full of trouble, you know, because of the fall and because of sin entering in, you know, I believe that is what, you know, the scenario we're in. We still have this mind, well, I believe everyone has this mindset of we should live forever. But we some, you know, as you said, as you're growing, you're growing up, it suddenly dawns on you, you know, as, as, as people pass away and, you know, death suddenly enters into your mindset. And then you realise, you know, how, you know, fragile and precious life is. You know, what, what came to mind again, I hope you don't mind me keep bringing these verses that come to mind, is, is in Romans. That's Romans chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. And it says, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So even within our spirits, we're groaning, knowing this ain't right. You know, and, and we receive that perfect body again come that great and glorious day. And I think that's what, you know, as a, as a contrast to what Job is saying. But we can understand why he's saying it, because, you know, he has eternity in mind, as every human spirit does, I believe. Okay. Um, I, I think I would be... Uh, there'd be negligent of me or I, certainly I I don't want to miss the opportunity since we're talking about that's inevitable for each one of us to die. I, I want everybody who watches this video today to be aware that uh, my wife just had to go back to Connecticut again uh, uh, to see her mother. Her mother's in like hospice care now and uh, she's re reaching the her last days. I mean, it could be today and it could be any moment. Uh, and um, of course, uh, I, I gave a, my own personal handmade Bible tract to my wife to go back there and, and so she could read it to her mother and they can discuss it. And so I'm, I'm sure she under, I want her to be sure she understands the, the true free gift of salvation. But so I just ask everybody to, uh, pray for uh, my wife's mother and, and their whole family to, at this difficult time for everyone. Uh, even though we know that it's coming at some point, uh, it's never easy to deal with uh, that, uh, that the terminal that, that when, it, when life is, does end. And uh, all right, I'm going to go on to the next verse. Um, it says in verse 2 he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down he fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not <laughs> yeah well when we come forth as a flower I mean, to me a flower uh, I mean who could argue that a flower is a beautiful thing uh, and so when, when man is when we are born, it, it is a beautiful thing. And as Brother Bill said, uh, when when God made man, his his intentions were for us not to die and for us to not get sick and suffer. Um, and, and But he knew that Adam and Eve would fall and all of mankind would inherit this uh, uh, sin nature and these, because of that, all these troubles, death, and and the consequences of sin, all these things would would happen. But he did, he did love us enough that he would provide the cure for this disease that man inherited. So the cure is available for everyone, and that is simply faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
but the thing that like, strikes me on this verse is that it talks about the uh, he, he cometh forth when we're born. It's like a flower. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, I mean, some people don't respect uh, the unborn or even the, the newly born. But but what, according to the scriptures, and I agree that every time a child is born, it is a beautiful thing. And, it, and there's so much hope for that person's life and future. Uh, but it says, and is cut down. Uh, so we're born, and sometimes we're cut down in a day, a month, a year, a decade, 70 years or more. But at some point, we get cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. So life begins with such hope like a flower. But then at some point, and this is, I think, very, very important for everybody to understand is that... Uh, the scripture says, today is the day of salvation. You are not promised one more day. I mean, I remember many times street preaching on Las Vegas Boulevard. Yeah, it seemed like almost every time, every day I was preaching, um, you'd see, you'd hear a siren and then an ambulance would come down Las Vegas Boulevard. And, and I, I just wanted to remind everybody, look, the person inside the ambulance didn't expect to be there today. Um, and, and that's how, that's how calamity is. And that's how death is. Sometimes it just comes suddenly unexpectedly. And that's why we're urged in the scriptures. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off another day because you may not have another day. Hey, brother Bill. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. None of us have promised tomorrow. And it does say in the word, you know, that, Oh, now is the day of salvation because we're not promised tomorrow, you know. And I, I was reminded of, of, of Isaiah 40, verse 8, you know, where it says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of a God shall stand forever. Now, we're, we're like the flowers, we're like the grass, you know, we're here today, gone tomorrow. You know, it doesn't matter how beautiful a flower we are or how scrawny a blade of grass we are in this life, you know, it's only temporal. And, and what really matters is that. that that, that we fix our, you know, ourselves on, on the permanent, which is Christ. You know, within that verse in Isaiah 48, you know, when I see the word of our God shall stand forever, not only is that talking about, you know, his, his written scriptural words, it's talking about Christ Jesus, who is the living word. You know, he will stand forever. You know, all who call upon him and come with him will also come that great glorious day, stand forever with him in glory. You know, never need to worry about, the, you know, these things like life and death and pain and suffering and, and hardship and, 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 and upset. So that, that's that's what, you know, we need to set our hope on is that Christ Jesus. But, yeah, it does, like I said, they're very fatalistic, <laughs> these few verses. But it's there for a reason. That it helps us, you know, humbles us perhaps, you know, because sometimes we go through life and think we're never going to die. And nothing really matters. We just carry on, you know, on our day-to-day -day routine. But life is precious. And as you just, you know, explained about mother-in-law, you know, time is precious. And we need to appreciate it. And above all, we need to, we need to know Christ. Well, one of the things that I've noticed from this study so far, and, and this is, this is uh, typical, and it doesn't matter what the subject matter is, uh, no matter what we're talking about, it seems like the, the subject goes around right here and then it circles around, and comes, always comes back to Christ. Uh, maybe it's just because we're evangelists, brother. Uh, maybe that's, that, that's our, we know this is what is primary and this is essential. And so every every time we talk about something, it, it, we can't help but coming back to, to Christ. I oh, know, I oh, know, yeah. That is that must be the, the evangelist in us. It has to be, yeah. It just either that or you know, just some people just well, maybe it's because I used to be wretched, and when I got good news, you, you just can't help keeping your mouth shut about it. You know, some someone who don't deserve this. Don't deserve that the greatest gift in the universe, yet it was freely bestowed upon me. So 
I, I can't shut up about it, and I won't shut up about it. All right, we'll go, we'll go on to the next verse. Uh, verse 3, And doth thou open thine eyes? Uh, and, and doth thou open thine eyes upon such a one, and bringest me into judgment with thee? Um, he, this is a, a, a speech to his friends, again, it's a, to get the context uh, uh, that uh, he has three people come to see him, and he's, his life's in a desperate situation. He's already lost his, uh, his uh, family, uh, his wealth, his, his, uh, his health, and uh, three friends come to visit him, and, and uh, they don't even speak to him for seven days. They, and uh, to me, I thought that was the only good thing that they did, uh, that I can <laughs> this entire experience, because uh, scriptures tell us that, uh, the best thing you can do is when someone is uh, um, grieving uh, is to grieve with them. Uh, the last thing I want to do or want to hear from somebody is if I'm if I'm completely heartbroken and crushed, I don't want to hear any encouraging words because there, there are certain times in life where you just don't want to hear it. Just just let me grieve. Let me, let me weep and get it all out, and you should join in and weep along with me. You know, have empathy for my for my suffering. And, but uh, so his three friends went on for seven days. But when the when Job finally spoke, and then they started answering him, it was nothing but finger pointing by these friends, and they blamed all Job's problems on him. That he God must be doing it. That was wrong. And it was because Job was a sinner and deserved it, and that was wrong too. Uh, we know that Job, his friends were, were not aware of it, and Job wasn't even aware of it. We know by reading the, the first few chapters that this was not God hurting him. God allowed it, uh, but it was Satan doing it. And, and it wasn't because of God's uh, Job's sin. It was because of his righteousness. The devil was saying he's only righteous and he only loves you because you blessed him so much. And if you let me do these bad things to him, you'll see that he'll just curse you. And so uh, Job is not aware of what transpired before and his friends are not. But they, as Brother Bill said, they have this religious viewpoint thinking that is uh, everything that happens is, is, a, is a consequence of our sin. But but that's not always the case. Uh all right, Brother Bill, uh, let me see. That was uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 3. What do you say about that? Well, no, I can't really add to what you've just said. Only that I, I just like to say, you know, with friends like Job, who needs enemies? Yeah, and... Uh, I hate to keep harping on it, but um, I, I, I've had this kind of experience. It's way, way too often where, you know, the people that are supposed to be friends that, that should, as, as I've said, they, they should just grieve along with us. Instead, they turned out to be worse than an enemy. Instead of, instead of helpful, they're, they're, they're adding to the problem. Um, let's go on to the next verse. Verse four, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Brother Bill, you comment on that first, will you? Well, I'd only just say that it goes to prove that, that every creature is born in sin. You know, it's not, not as if, you know, God or Job had been horrible towards, you know, mothers giving birth, but, you know, because of the fall, we're all born into sin. In that sense, that was unclean, and that cannot be made clean, you know, for our, our mortality and, our, and our, our right living and stuff like that. It can't be done. Only crows can clean, so I'll get that in as well. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking, that uh, um, the first thing a person needs to understand is that they are unclean, that we, we're all sinners. In, in, in God's eyes, 
no matter how man think highly man thinks of himself when god sees us we were just as the scripture says like filthy rags in the sight of god that's what that's how our righteousness is so insufficient and so if we understand that we are unclean that we are sinners the problem with the world is that the world believes that okay if you're bad all you got to do is clean your act up just clean up your act and change your life and and the scriptures here are saying is no one can do that no one can make anything that's unclean clean again and this is spiritually uh, that's why we need god to do it because man cannot do it for himself all right i'll go on to the next verse verse five seeing his days are determined the number of his months are with thee thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass all right brother bill well yes clearly saying that you know mortal man's days are numbered by god and it and cannot you can't go past you know that those boundaries you know if god has determined that you're going to live to 70 you're going to live to 70. If he determines you're going to live to 90, you're going to live to 90. You know, I suppose the only exception to take a spanner in the works is old Hezekiah. You know, that, you know, he, he was due to die, but, you know, he really prayed to God and he was really, you know, broken hearted that, that God actually repented, changed his mind, and gave him an extra 15 years. But God knew that anyway. I was just being, you know, a bit silly there. But yeah, our days are numbered. God. God knows exactly how long we're going to live and determine how long we're going to live as he knows every, you know, he numbers the hairs on our head. You know, I've got a few hairs that most people, but he still knows how many I've got. Yeah, uh, I have less than I used to, you see. You've got more than me though. <laughs> All right, go on to the next one, verse six. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as a hireling his day. Okay, I'm a little confused. Turn from him that he may rest. Who is that referring to, Brother Bill? Yeah, I don't know. Have a look. You're going to have to look at another translation there because it seems like it's, you know, it has to turn away from God or something. But yeah, have, have a read in a, in a different... Okay. All right. Um, in uh, the KJV, it says, turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as a hireling his day. I think this is still referring to... Uh, um, I don't know. I'm just a little confused as to who that, that is referring to. All right, I'll go on to the next verse, um, verse 7. For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Uh, That's that one, that one that I explained earlier, I think. The, um, well, you want to elaborate on that further? Well, it's got a couple of veins running through it. One is there's hope. So even though something's being hewed down, you know, it could still have life in it and, and, and re, you know, reestablish itself, you know, and I akin that. To, to you know the the the, the smoke and flax and the bruised reed, you know in all intents and purposes that was broken and it was burnt out, but you know God has mercy on that on that smoke and flax and burnt reed, or the humble person or the broken person, and restored and renewed, in that sense. So there's a little bit, although this is as you say it's fatalistic, you get a little a little glimpse of hope in that verse there. Yeah, I, I can see this as a picture of the resurrection. Um, 
It says, there is hope of a tree if it be cut down. So uh, comparing man to this tree, if, if, if when man does die, that it will sprout again, that man will come back to life again. Uh, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth bow, bows, bows like a plant. Uh, I've seen that happen with trees and, you know, where we've removed a tree and, and the, the roots are still in the ground and then they come back and the tree starts growing again. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, and the interesting thing about the resurrection that I think, first of all, um, unless someone has really studied the scriptures, then most people are not even familiar with the concept of the resurrection. Uh, I, I've, I've known uh, quite a few Roman Catholics, and, and when I discuss with them that we're going to be resurrected from the dead, and that in eternity, we will actually have physical bodies, uh, they're amazed. Uh, they, because unless a person has studied the scriptures, they don't re learn that in your typical churches and in, uh, in Roman Catholicism or just people who just uh, haven't really studied. And they're very, very surprised and amazed uh, by the fact that there's going to be a resurrection. Uh, they, they understand maybe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, but they do, they're not aware that all of mankind, and, and it just says the resurrection of the just and the unjust. The just are those people who will have eternal life in, the, in heaven because of their faith in Jesus. They are considered just. They're justified because of their faith. And the unjust are those people who uh, have never put their faith in Jesus, and, and therefore they never receive the gift of eternal life. But both of these groups will be resurrected from the dead. And so it, as we see here in these verses here, it talks about there's a hope that when your uh, the tree dies, that it will spring back to life at some point. Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah I'm just impressed how you spiritualize them verses. I think you're bang on. There's certainly a spiritual element there, and I didn't say that, so I'm glad you did. Good plug for the resurrection there. All right. Uh, I would add to it before we move on, though, that uh, I don't, uh, I, I, if you're watching this now, we don't want you to be resurrected uh, as an unjustified person. You're going to be resurrected, and, and we're going to all face God. But when Brother Bill and I face God, we'll be embraced as a child of God because of our faith in Jesus. And if you never put your faith in Jesus, you'll be resurrected and you, you go to the great white throne judgment and you'll be found, found lacking. You never put your faith in Jesus, so you're lacking the gift of eternal life. And your fate will not be eternity in heaven. Your fate will be the second death in the lake of fire. So even though we're all going to get resurrected, it's important to understand that you want to go in the right resurrection, the resurrection of the justified people. All right, uh, I'll read the next verse. Um, uh, I think I'm on verse 11. As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, so man lieth down and riseth not, Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Hmm. That that one's actually interesting, and that that goes in about you know where God folds up the, you know the stars and everything, you know folds up the corners of the universe, you know the stars and everything kind of vanish away at that great and terrible day. That 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 ties into that quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on, on the surface, someone might say, well, that just contradicts what you've just been saying, that everybody's going to be raised uh, from the dead. But I think that applies after this resurrection, after the judgment, after the second death, then it's final. Um, and do, do you think I'm correct in seeing it that way or not? No, I think what you initially said, that ties in with that as well. You know, because it says, you know, be no more, they shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. That's the, where's the, uh, so which is true. So he lowers, and it says, till the heavens be no more. So, because he creates a new heavens, a new earth, 
So people are raised. I, I know it's because it's very complicated because to die is to be immediately with Christ in God's time frame. So we're dealing with two different time frames here. In man's time frame, you know, it, it could seem like 2,000 years. But in God's timeline, it's a blink of an eye and it's immediate. So to be, to be dead is to be with Christ if you're a Christian. So, yes, trying to fathom the two different time lines, God's time pattern and our time pattern, and fit that in accordingly. But I think that that, that does basically back up what we were saying earlier. Okay, well, maybe it maybe it'd be helpful also to address this subject of um, um, men's consciousness um, and, and compared to the uh, teaching of soul sleep. Um, uh, there's a there's a brother on YouTube that uh, has been trying to convince me of soul sleep, and he sent me I don't know 50 different verses that support it, and. Um, if it weren't for some other things in the scriptures that uh, convinced me otherwise, then, you know, uh, maybe those verses would actually be persuasive. Uh, but uh, so I haven't been won over by him and moved to the side of soul sleep. And that just means that uh, there are some people uh, that believe that when we die, um, our soul our con and our consciousness, our mind, our, we are totally unaware. When the Bible says you're sleeping, like in this verse here, uh, it says in verse uh, 12, it says, uh, So man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So there's a lot of verses that use the term sleep. And when a person is laying and they're dead, they look like they're sleeping. So that's that's why I think that the Bible uses the term sleep. But uh, those advocates of soul sleep believe that your soul is actually unconscious and unaware of the passing time, that your soul is not immediately with the Lord after we die. They believe that uh, your, your soul is uh, just sleeping like your body until the resurrection. Uh, that's when you receive consciousness again. Uh, and I, I don't believe that's the case. I'm not going to try to argue for that now, but I could see how a person could take a verse like this and and, and maybe be uh, enticed into the doctrine of soul sleep. Brother Bill? Yeah, that's a, that's a real hard subject. And, and I think most of it boils down to semantics anyway. But it, it, it's hard to understand because we are living in different time frames you know because we know that, you know a day with the lord is a thousand years so god is above and beyond outside inside and every fathomable position within time whereas we're not we're, we're only in one certain time frame and you know as humans where god is inside and out so that's why that's why it's very complicated you know so i, I don't want to stir up any controversy and, and you know, say where I think, you know, who is exactly right and who isn't right. All I can say is that, you know, some things are still a mystery. Uh, but I also know that as soon as I die, that I will be with Christ that very second, even if it's in a thousand years to his resurrection. So that's all I, that's all I can say, because that's what the scriptures say. Oh, Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but laugh at your your statement there. Uh, I know you weren't trying to be funny, but it's, it, it is kind of funny in a way that uh, you'll be with him that very second, even if it is a thousand years later. And that's really kind of the argument that you, we take the verse um, absent from the body uh, is present with the Lord. And we use that verse to support the idea that we, we die and we're instantly with the Lord. Uh, and and but someone who believes in the soul sleep uh, doctrine, they would say absent from the body and present with the Lord. As far as you know, you weren't aware that a thousand years had passed or a hundred years or five years. You weren't just weren't aware of it because you were sleeping. So it seemed like you died and you're immediately with the Lord. To me, it doesn't matter which way, because either way, we're, it's going to seem like we die and we're instantly with instantly with the Lord. 
but I, uh, I don't want to give anybody the impression that I, that's what I'm advocating. I, I disagree with it, but I, I don't think it's uh, anything that, uh, like the, the brother that's been trying to persuade me of this, you know, I'm not going to shun him just because of he, he sees it differently than I do. Uh, one last word on that, Brother Bill, before we move on. Yeah, I mean, it's a mystery. <laughs> all, all that matters is if you believe on Christ, when you die, you're going to be with him straight away. That's what matters. Okay, amen. All right, uh, so now we're going to go. I'm going to read in the KJV now uh, the remainder of the chapter uh, uh, continuously, uh, and then we'll come back to it one verse at a time as we did earlier, starting with verse um, 13. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until the, thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to the work of thine hands. For thou, for now thou numberest my steps Dost thou not watch over my sin? My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up mine iniquity. And surely the mountains falling come, coming, cometh to naught, and the rock is removed out of his place. The waters wear the stones. Thou washest away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth, and thou destroyest the hope of man. Thou prevailest forever against him, and he passeth. Thou changest his countenance, and sendest him away. His sons come to honor, and he knowest it not. And they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not of them. But his flesh upon him shall have pain, and his soul within him shall mourn. I, uh, I want to ask you to comment on that first. Yeah, the first, like I said, the first few verses are, are really, really speaking to me about the resurrection again. You know, he wants to be hid from the wrath of God. And, and then he goes, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of, of my appointed time will await till my change come. As if he is, it's as if he's alluding to this change that the, the, the immortal put that the mortal puts on the immortal you know that the, the corruptible puts on the incorruptible so it, it seems like he's, he's speaking of the, of the the last day the resurrection in that sense and three verses um yeah i i, I think you're right there and it, it you have to be careful uh, the way things are phrased sometimes particularly in the KJV, as, as I've said, I'm a KJV firstist, but sometimes because it's the English is an old style of writing and we're not as uh, familiar with it or necessarily comfortable with it, you can immediately take it wrong. It's as if a man die, shall he live again? Um, when someone could argue that Job is saying, you don't ever live again, you just die and that's the end of it. But he's, he's asking if there's a question mark there because he's asking it, but then he's answering it at the same time saying, yeah, uh, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. And that's what you were referring to in terms of, yeah, we're all going to be changed. The, Paul says we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And whether there's a rapture separated by a period of time and then a resurrection or it's a simultaneous event, it's not the issue here. The question is that we will all be changed and resurrected. And as we said earlier, you must be resurrected as a justified person because of your faith in Jesus. So that's what we're urging everyone to do now. Okay, Brother Bill, but we're going to go through it one verse at a time. But before we do, anything else to add? No, no, no. Yeah, we can start doing it one, one verse at a time and we'll break it down. All right. So I'm going to look at it in the Amplified. And you, uh, 
be careful as I'm going through it on the Amplified, if there's something in the KJV in any of these verses that is uh, like uh, significant as a difference, then uh, let, let us know, okay? Um, verse 13, Oh, that you would hide me in Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would set a definite time and then remember me and in your loving kindness imprint me on your heart. I mean, that, that pretty much backs up what, you know, what the King James is saying there. Yeah, because graves show, you know, that that is a change. All right. Um, so um, that you would set a definite time and then remember me. Uh, see, so this is also uh, alluding to the idea that even after we die, even if we're in the grave, there's at a certain time, there's a definite time and, and that it's already established before the foundation of the world. God, God knew. Uh, every person that would be born, he knew everything about our lives. He knew about who, which of us would put our faith in Jesus. He knew the day we die. He knew how long we'd be in the grave before the resurrection. None of this is going to be news or a surprise to God. So there's a definite time, and then he will remember us. That's, to me, another uh, picture of the resurrection. Well, yes, also a good picture of uh, the faith on the cross. Remember me. That's all he declared, and he was saved. And, and you know, it seems that he's crying out, you know, Job and he, his affliction of humanity. It's just asking God, remember me. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, the thief on the cross now. It's very good uh, because not only do we have the word remember me, but we also have a, 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 a particular example of the re refutation of soul sleep because the, the thief on the cross put his faith in Jesus right then and Jesus said today you will be with me in paradise um, uh, so uh, to me I'm, th that's one example there's many other reasons that I'm not uh, an advocate of soul sleep uh, doctrine but that, that's one verse there that you brought up that to me just tells me, wait a second, that thief is not going to be, he didn't say that uh, you'll die and then uh, some some point in time I'll wake you up and and uh, and you'll be with me. He said, today you're going to be with me. Okay. All right, let's go to the uh, verse 14. If a man dies... Will he live again? I will wait all the days of my struggle until my change and release will come. Brother Bill? That's, that's the one I was naughty because I jumped ahead. So we covered that one at the beginning, basically. So if Job asked the question, you know, if a man dies, shall he live again? The obvious answer, he will, because he says all the days, you know, <laughs> All the days of my point in time will I wait. So he knows he's waiting for, for this for this redemption, this resurrection. And then he goes on, till my change come. So you talk, this is a saved man speaking. They know that he's going to put off this this mortal and then put on the immortal. Well, as you said, you know, he's in a twinkling of eyes, it's all going all gonna to happen. So he's even alluding to that there. Yeah, and it is important to understand that uh, Job is saved. Now, uh, I have a playlist titled, I think, uh, um, Dispensationalism, Millennialism, uh, The Rapture. I, I remember exact title, but it's something like that. And it, it, uh, it, it, discusses the concepts of dispensationalism and the millennium and the rapture. Um, but I, I have another playlist called Paul Onlyism uh, debunked. But the, the, the reason I made those is be, because of this um, 
Oops, let me look at the verse again so I can. Um, man dies when living. Oh, uh, I forgot why I was relating that. I brought that up at that time. I, it was based on something you said, Brother Bill. Can I better I back up to you and, yeah, and yes. repeat it? The fact that Job was already saved. He was a saved man. So he was saved like Abraham by faith. This is pre, obviously, this is even pre uh, the Mosaic Covenant times. So yes. he was saved then like Noah and Abraham by, by faith. Yeah, th thank you for, for bailing me out there. I mean, when you're uh, when you're 64 years old, maybe you will suffer from this, uh, uh, you know, bad memory, syndrome, bad memory syndrome and going off on some kind of tangent and not know where I was, what I'm talking about. I hope you don't have to suffer from that. I do. I suffer already. I suffer already, but I'll, I'll keep it hidden as much as I can. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for recalling that for me, but the, that is the point I wanted to make is that uh, before, even before the Mosaic law and Judaism was established, that's where we believe Job takes place. We talked early on in the study, the first one or two studies on Job, uh, to try to determine the, the, uh, the time frame that Job uh, fits. Um, so you can go back and see the arguments for when it took place, but, but, but I believe it's definitely before Moses and before the law. Uh, and, and then we have Moses establishing the Mosaic laws and Judaism. And, and then we have the cross, the New Testament. And uh, the uh, Moses, I mean, uh, Job here, he's, he's uh, living at a time where there was no savior uh, who died for their sins. But I have another playlist called The Bloody Trail. And that in that playlist, what I've attempted to do is start in the first chapter of Genesis and go all the way through the scriptures and show all the examples of blood being shed as a picture of a future blood sacrifice that would be given for the sins of the world. And that future sacrifice would be Jesus Christ dying for our sins on the cross. But throughout all the scriptures, we have these bloody events uh, that are what basically forecasting or shadows of this future event. And so Job, we think he's, he's a saved person. And even though his sins had not been paid for at that point, he still had faith in God to, to save him. He didn't know that he's going to be named Jesus at this point. And he didn't know a lot of the facts that we know, but he knew he had to rely on God to save him because he was incapable uh, as, he, as it said in the earlier verse, what did it say? That we're all uh, uh, something and, and no one can change it. What is, was the word that was used? Uh, um, uh, oh, yeah, verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. And so Job knew even then that there's nothing he could do about his sin problem. He had to rely on God for salvation instead of trying to clean up, clean up himself and make himself acceptable. And that's really what uh, the salvation has always been about. Um, uh, from the time of Adam and Eve, uh, they, they, they could have chosen to just trust God all the time instead of trying to, to uh, elevate themselves by acquiring the knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then trying to figure out how to live their lives based upon their own understanding. They should have just trusted God instead of doing that. And so th throughout all of history of man, it's been an issue of, will you try to do it your way or will you just trust God? And and, and, and even today, it's, a, it's the same question. Will you trust God? His name is Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He raised himself from the dead so that you can have life everlasting. Will you trust him? Or are you going to try to do it some other way based on your own understanding instead of what the scriptures tell us? That's the question that has, uh, we have today. Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as we've seen, you know, just in this, you know, it's amazing what we've drawn out of just one chapter so far. You know, we've had the we've had pictures of the death, the burial, the resurrection, being saved by faith alone. You know, all all, all these things in the Old Testament 
whether deliberate or accidental, though I don't think it's accidental, are alluding or, or are, are picturing Christ all the way through. You know, Christ has been pictured throughout the whole Old Testament, you know, and then he was revealed in the New. But, you know, just in this one verse, it's amazing what we've drawn out of it. You know, I've almost got a gospel message out of what seemed to be a depressing, uh, fatalistic chapter is actually between the, you know, behind the veil of fatalism, we're seeing hope, we're seeing Christ, we're seeing resurrection. And, and that's that's really the power of God being manifest there. That's that's what I'm finding amazing. Yeah, uh, it's there's a saying that uh, to me kind of really, um, we were talking about this earlier before we started the show about uh, the term rightly divide the word of God. And um, Brother Joe Byron, uh, after watching my series on Paul only ism debunked, he said, this is how you rightly unite the word of God. Uh, but the, 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 the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, it, it's really one story. It's one thing that's, that's, that is uh, told throughout the whole thing. And, and that's a man's need for God to, do, to save him and provide for him instead of trying to rely on himself. Uh, and there's, there's a saying that kind of should give you a real good uh, con understanding of this whole concept. And it says that the, the New Testament is concealed inside the Old Testament. But the, 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 the Old Testament is revealed through the New Testament. So think about that and you'll understand how the, this is all one story. The Testament uh, is called Old and New Testament only because of one thing. And, and, and it's, it's explained in the book of Hebrews. It says the, the, the Testament begins at the death of the testator. The testator is Jesus Christ. At his death, that's a dividing point. Before the cross, after the cross. So, uh, but uh, the Old Testament shows pictures of this cross in the future, this death. And that then the New Testament, we see how all of the pictures in the Old Testament have, have come to pass. Okay, brother? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so what I've heard is, is the old, you know, Christ is concealed in the Old Testament or revealed in the New. So, yeah, so it's, it's always has been, always will be, you know, that, that Christ is Savior, you know, before the foundation of even the world. You know, we, we, none of us have took God by surprise, you know, at all. And God in his love and his mercy, it shows how loving and merciful God is, before the foundation of the world even existed, God has made plan that he was going to be manifest in flesh and save humanity. Despite and inspire ourselves. That, that's my word. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go on. Uh, uh, I think it's, I'm on verse 15. It says, um, "Then you will call, and I will answer you. You will long for me, the work of your hands. But now you number each of my steps." You do not observe nor take note of my sin. Okay, I want to read verse 15. That was 15 and 16. Let me read verse 15 first, and then I ask you to comment on it. It says, then you will call me, I think, and I will answer you. You will long for me uh, the works of your hands. Brother? Yeah, 16 is easier than your 15 is again you know we we, we could allude it to the the, the resurrection the, the trumpet call you know god calls and then you know the, the dead and cross rolls and the ones who remain caught up as well so it's god that does the call in here and he says i will answer thee they will have desire you know to the work of thine hands so he's you know there's accountability there but then verse 16 says for thou numbers my steps thus thou not watch over my sin now if you read that can you read 16 again from the amplifier but you'd have to unmute yourself over to it yeah okay uh 16 from the amplified is but now you number each of my steps 
you do not observe nor take note of my sin. So that, that's a good one there, isn't it? So it's as if, because this is a saved man again. This proves he's a saved man because we got later on in the New Testament, in Hebrews 8, 12, you know, God clearly says, for I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. So God has chosen, because this is a man of faith, to, to remember uh, his sins and iniquities no more. He's chosen not to, to, to account them to him. And that is a New Testament picture of what Christ done, because he made payment for sin. So again, this is, you know, this whole chapter is screaming out, you know, not only the resurrection, it's screaming out the atonement here as well in that verse. Yeah, I'd say it is pretty amazing that uh, even at this point in history, that uh, long before the cross, non, long before the name Jesus was revealed as the, uh, the, the name above all names, the, the, uh, there's salvation in his name, uh, Job was not privy to all these facts as we know them now, and yet he understood that sin was not going to prevent him from being with God because, because he had faith in God, faith that God would love him and forgive him, and he, he put his faith in God uh, for that reason. Uh, he felt that his sins were not going to be counted against him, and that's what we say today. It's, just, it's the same thing that Job said. God is not angry with us, holding our sins against us. He's not imputing sin to, to us today, but he wasn't doing it back then if you would just trust him. Uh, I want to read this other first verse, though, and uh, let me see, uh, talk about that a little bit more. Uh, um, verse 15, then you will call. Now, I think this is referring to God will call him. And, of course, uh, uh, God call, calls all of us. Uh, uh, Jesus is calling, uh, drawing all men. He says, uh, when I'm lifted up, in that manner, I will draw all men to me. So uh, God desire, does not desire that any of us should perish. So God is calling and drawing all of us to him. And he says, and I, I will answer you. Job is saying, I, I will answer you. I mean, I, I will, I'm, I'm listening to you and I want to come to you and be with you. You will long for me. You will long for me the work of your hands. Now, I think that could mean that the work of your hands is the fact that God does the work. Uh, it's not up. It's not our work that that uh, is uh, the deciding factor for our salvation. It's God's work. As Jesus, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, uh, "What is the work that God requires of us? What what work must we do to do the works of God?" And Jesus said, "This is the work of God that ye believe in the one He has sent." So the, the work of God is that uh, the fact that we, we believe in what God's going to do for us instead of believing that we are the answer, believe that God is the answer. And this God that is the answer, that was the one true God, Jesus Christ, our Savior God. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I misread it at first because I, I, I read it as if that was Job's work of his hands, but reading again as you just did and, and especially in conjunction with, with verse you know 16 we can clearly say that it's god's work his handiwork in this which is which is you know of the importance okay this next verse is very exciting verse 17 job is saying my transgression is sealed up in a bag and you cover my wickedness from your view Wow, <laughs> I'll let you talk about that, brother. Well, again, that, that again, as we were saying, that was amazing. Verse sixteen, it actually sounds better in, in believe it or not, in the King James verse seventeen, because it says, "My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest mine up." You know, my iniquity. So he's sowing the bag up. So God has chosen to get all of Job's sins, past, present, and future, chuck it in the bag, sow it up. And that's it. It can't be seen again. He's, that's amazing, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. It is amazing. Uh, all these all these New Testament principles we're seeing here in the Book of Job, and it was long before the cross. Um, uh, verse eighteen. But as a mountain, if it falls, crumbles into nothing, and as the rock is moved from its place, water wears away the stones, its floods and torrents wash away the soil of the earth, so you, O Lord, destroy the hope of man. <laughs> wow. This is, this is now, there, see, there's, there's a difference between... Uh, a doctrine and and just the, the the opinions of Job some of these things we can see that this and they this is a doctrine that we accept even today and then there's there's some things where Job is clearly wrong uh, as, as we know we know more about what's going on at this point than Job is aware Job is not aware that uh, the devil is the one harming him not God he's not aware that uh, it's not based upon his sin. He even in the previous chapters, he's, he's arguing, no, I don't deserve this. It's not because I've sinned. Uh, he's telling his friends. And then finally he even says, if, if it's because of my sin, then, then forgive me or crush me or whatever you want to do. And I'm sorry. But uh, so he even considers the possibility that maybe God is doing it to him because of his sin. And yet he's wrong. So sometimes the scriptures is uh, saying something but it's not correct. It's the example I like to give is another one that Brother Jill Byron uh, used to illustrate something that uh, when I was talking about the book of James, um, he, he says, uh, sometimes we find false doctrine in the, in the Bible, like uh, the Sadducees said there was no resurrection. Now in the Bible it says, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. So are we supposed to believe that that's the truth? No, they were teaching something that was false, that, that Jesus said that's, that's incorrect. And so here we see Job having an opinion that uh, we, we can see as false, uh, but, it, but it is written down in the scriptures. Can you, uh, hope I'm not confusing anybody, but Brother Bill, do you see the distinction between these two things? We don't see the distinction, and I'm, I'm going to even go on a... On, on a <laughs> in another layer here, that that it seems that that Job here is is having again another New Testament scenario, same as Paul, you know, back between between the flesh and the spirit, you know, in verses fifteen and sixteen and seventeen, through spiritual. So he knows in the spiritual sense he's a saved man, and and, and all his faith is on God. Then he go down eighteen and nineteen again. That's his flesh and his carnal self, and sees. You know calamity and disaster so it seems to be torn between flesh and spirit where we can glean and discern the spiritual things you know we're gleaning a lot this evening and i hope people are watching are gleaning along with us that we've got the whole we've got the whole caboodle here we've got the resurrection we've got salvation by faith we've got the atonement we've got everything in the spiritual segments but we've also got in the physical and fleshly carnal segments you know, someone who's really woeful and kind of, you know, taking these eyes off Christ just for a little bit. Yeah, it's, uh, but the, the, the thing that really we, we, we have to give Job complete credit for, even though we see that he doesn't understand the, the whole situation perfectly, uh, he does understand that, uh, um, he's, he has faith in God and, and God is right and, and that he's, he's, he's not going to blame God and, and, and be angry with God and, and um, as his wife said, curse God so he can just die. And his wife was saying, why don't you just curse God and die and have this suffering over with. And, and even though he, he got some doubts, his so-called friends put doubts in his mind and he even wondered, if, if, are you doing this to me because of my sin? And uh, and yet he he never would curse God and die. He never would stop loving God and, and trusting God. Uh, let's go to the uh, verse 20. You prevail forever against him and overpower him, and he passes on. 
you change his appearance and send him away from the presence of the living. Uh, verse 21, his sons achieve honor and he does not know it. They become insignificant and he is not aware of it. But his body, lamenting its decay, grieves and pain over it, and his soul mourns over the loss of himself. Okay, let's go with verse 21st. Brother Bill? Uh, well, that, to me, that's just saying that, that, that God has got literally the power over life and death. You know, it's him who determines whether he's, you know, in the land of the living or sent to the, the land of the not living in that sense so god is you know all powerful in that and prevails against every element and everything you know god determines life and death yeah uh, uh and then verse 21 uh i find this very interesting uh, it says his sons achieve honor and his, he's talking about his, it's talking about someone who's died. A man dies and his sons achieve honor, but the man does not even know it, know about it. They become insignificant and he's not aware of it. So he's saying after we die, we don't even know what's become of our, our posterity. Uh, and that, that brings us to the question that some people think that, uh, um, When people die that they're like our loved ones are around us in another dimension observing us and here and you can or you can go to their grave and they're right there and, and uh, it's just a, in a different kind of dimension uh, but I, I there is and when I did my study on heaven on the, the, the I studied the subject of heaven and did a 50-hour teaching on it 50 hours about heaven it was uh, the i think the title of it now is uh, 50 hours in heaven and one point we're talking about the idea that when we're in heaven do we do we know what's going on in, on earth uh and there are some scriptures that say that we are celebrating about what's going on in earth you know so it seems that um while in heaven, as things are playing out on earth, as prophecies are playing out in, in, in end times, that those people in heaven uh, get to see it. But we don't get the impression that uh, if I died right now and I, I'm, I'm up in heaven, that I get to observe Brother Bill's life and see how his is going and, and my son and my wife and everybody else. I don't, I'm not privy to everything that's going on in their life all the time. Uh, it's not the impression we get as we study uh, heaven. And, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm seeing here, is that I, I think that's what it's really uh, talking about. Yeah. yeah, it seems like two elements, as you just said, that yeah, we're, when we pass from this life to the next, we're, we're not privy in the sense of people's individual lives, but because we're with Christ, you know, we're, we're privy to... to prophecies being fulfilled apocalyptic times even as we're going towards the end so there's certain things we're privy of and we're rejoicing as christ is glorified not only in heaven but on earth but obviously we're not privy to people's individual lives you know that's not our job that's not our realm we've got it's god who's omnipresent omniscient not ours so yeah there's 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 yeah, a couple of elements going on there and i think he's speaking of obviously not being privy to individual lives that, that are going on you know his family's relations and stuff like that on earth but he will be privy to, to seeing prophecies being fulfilled and privacy to, to, to christ being glorified on earth okay uh, let's let's move on now to uh, the next chapter ch chapter 15. i'm going to read it at first in the kjv um, and if necessary, we'll probably have to go back to the Amplified to better understand it. Maybe it'll, it might be helpful. It says, 
chapter 15, verse 1, Then answered Eliphaz the Temanite and said, Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk or with speeches wherewith he can do no good? Yea, thou casteth off fear. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yea, thou castest off fear and restrainest prayer before God. For thy mouth uttereth thine iniquity, and thou choosest the tongue of the crafty. Thine own mouth condemneth thee, and not I. Yea, thine own lips testify against thee. Art thou the first man that was born? Or wast thou made before the hills? Hast thou heard the secret of God? And dost thou restrain wisdom to thyself? What knowest thou that thou we know that we know not? What understandest thou which is not in us? With us are both the gray headed and very aged man much elder than thy father, and the consolations of God small with thee. Is there any secret thing with thee? Why doth thine heart carry thee away? And what do, do thy eyes wink at? That thou turnest thy spirit against God, and lettest such words go out of thy mouth. What is man that he should be clean, and he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous? Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. I will show thee, hear me, and that which I have seen I will declare, which, which wise men have foretold from their fathers and have not hid it, unto whom alone the earth was given, and no stranger passed among them. The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. A dreadful sound is in his ears. In prosperity the destroyer shall come upon him. He believeth not that he shall return out of darkness, and he is waited for of the sword. He wandereth abroad for bread, saying, Where is it? He knoweth that the day of darkness is ready at his hand. Trouble and anguish shall make him afraid. They shall prevail against him as a king ready to the battle. Well, let me stop there. It goes on and on. But uh, um, you're, this is one of his friends. <laughs> and as I said, with friends like this, you don't need enemies. Uh, I mean, there is a place for... Um, uh, telling a friend a hard truth. I mean, you, you don't want to uh, um, let a friend continue in in, in her heresy or deception. And, you know, if we really are friends, we'll tell them. I forgot the there's a scripture that speaks about such a thing. Uh, you probably know it, Brother Bill, but. It, we, we shouldn't just, just, uh, just tickle people's ears and tell them nice things if it's time to tell them the hard truth. But these friends are uh, just really uh, rubbing salt into his wounds. And as we know, they're not aware, but we know that that's not the case at all. All their accusations against Job here and his situation are false. Okay, so I mean, this this is go on, but let's uh, let's. What's your reaction initially to this before we go through it one verse at a time? Well, it's certainly not an encouragery, I'll tell you. And this this really speaks volumes of, of again religiosity. This is almost pharisaical. You know, he goes he goes even beyond the threshold of not rebuking. You know, because we're supposed to rebuke and reproof and do all these things in love, in the love of Christ. So if someone's in hell, heresy, we lovingly give them a slap on the wrist, say, look, this, this really ain't on, you don't do this, blah, 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 in love. But reading how he, Eliphaz is actually saying this, there seems to be a vein of maliciousness in there. Very legalistic, very judgmental, very harsh. And, and as we've said already, with friends like that, who needs enemies? 
He's so not not only is is Eddie Fair so off the mark of the truth in this whole you know story and scenario, but he's just been very callous, very very cruel, cruelly legalistic, I believe. Um, do you think that uh, this Eliphaz, the Temanite, uh, is, is is he alive and roaming the earth today, as far as his kind? Oh, absolutely everywhere. You've got the Roman church full of them and you've got Lordship Salvation that's full of them. We're very much, the Eliphaz is very much, or the spirit of Eliphaz is very much alive today. Very much. All right. Um, so we'll break this down now, a line at a time here. I'll look at it in the Amplified. Uh, Okay, the, the, the title of this, they gave a title to this chapter. It says, Eliphaz says Job presumes much. Verse 1, then Eliphaz the Temanite answered Job and said, should a wise man such as you utter such windy and vain knowledge as, as we have just heard and fill himself with the east wind of withering, parching, and violent accusations? Okay, that's uh, verse 1 and 2. Brother Bill? Well, yeah, just straight off with judgmental, isn't it? You know, he's, he's, because he, he's missing the point again. He says, should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind? You know, as if he's been tossed to and fro of every wind of doctrine. But Eliphaz doesn't realize the previous verse where Job was talking, there is a lot of spiritual wisdom there. And Eliphaz is utterly blind to it. And we see that today in religionity. You know, there's a, there's a lot of truth in what the so-called carnal Christians or, or babes in Christ speak, but they're immediately shot down because it doesn't, you know, fit in their, their mentality, their ideological thoughts. And as I see this with Eliphaz, Job has spoke wisdom, very deep spiritual wisdom in regard to the resurrection, this Christ, faith, the time, and all this. And Eliphaz, that goes straight above his head, and straight away he, he, he's he's mocking Job and, and and you know making him out to be you know an idiot that he isn't for, you know filled with wisdom and he's been tossed to and fro in that sense. So yeah. One of the things that uh, I noticed when uh, his uh, friends came on the scene here and started lecturing him is that uh, they're very eloquent and they, they seem like they, they're speaking with such authority. And uh, if we didn't know better, uh, you know, you might be very impressed. It just And I, I see that same thing happening today. People are so easily impressed with people because they're articulate or passionate and they're impressed with it even though what they're teaching is completely wrong they're saying is is untrue and yet they're so good at at uh, expressing it that they're impressed i mean i i can think of people on youtube and people in uh televangelism and t t today that I, I would compare in that same way, that uh, and they're very articulate, but what they're saying is completely wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, yeah, very cliche, if there's such a word. You know, a lot of these people, as you say, that they're eloquent, and they use cliches, which really wind me up. I know we're going off tangent here, but I think it needs to be said. You know, when you get, you know, Lordship Salvacious, you know, that as a cliche, they say... You know, Jesus Christ is, is Lord of all or not at all. Sounds good. Sounds very religious and pious. And, you know, Jesus should be Lord. But in reality, you know, it's utter nonsense. It's a cliche. Yeah, he is Lord of all. He's Lord of the sinner. He's Lord of the hellbound. He's Lord of Satan. He's Lord of everyone. You know, but to say, you know, he's Lord of all, not at all, is, is, is to, to say that, you know, unless you're, you know, like them, you're very religious, you're very pious, and you, you obviously don't sin, and you, 
you make sure you pay your mint a tithe and do everything else that a religious person does, that you're not you're not seeing Christ Jesus as Lord. And, and this is the same sort of vein we're getting from Eliphaz. Very religious, you know, not not taking in uh, consideration, you know, people's lives, their circumstances, their situation, and even of the heart that, that no man can see, that only God can see and judge. And I think, yeah, very much alive, and this is very poignant, you know. Yeah, another another cliche that came to mind as you were talking was how a lordship salvationist would answer me and say, yes, I, I believe salvation is through faith alone, but faith is never really alone. <laughs> you know, as soon as they, <laughs> but, you know, they, you know, I have a video titled, no ifs, ands, or buts, you know, but as soon as they say a, a doctrine and then they say, but, you know, the next thing out of their mouth is going to be heresy. Yeah. And you know that every time a but is added, everything that was said previous to it is negated. So the moles are not saying, the moles are just skip out the first and just say, you know, as you just said, that the, what the cliche is, you know, that salvation is by faith alone, but faith is never alone. They need to knock out the first bit and just say faith is never alone. It's got to be by works. Then you get to the true heart of the actual, what they're saying and mean. Amen. All right. Um, I'll look at the next verse here, uh, verse 3. Should he rebuke and argue with useless talk or with words in which there is no benefit? Indeed, you are doing away with fear and, and you are diminishing meditation before God. For your guilt teaches your mouth and you choose to speak the language of the crafty and cunning well that's, that's like, like i said that is again that is so derogatory in it this is no i'll tell you what if i had a friend like that he'd have a slap i've been carnal there but I, that is really no friend at all is it it's really deriding poor old job here yeah it's so true uh and he when he goes on and uh Verse 6, your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Were you the first man to be born, the original wise man, or were you created before the hills? Do you hear the secret counsel of God, and do you limit the possession of wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not equally clear to us? I just have to, verse 6 there, it's so self-righteous where he puts it, he says, you know, thine own, thine own mouth condemneth thee, and not I. The self-righteous, the I, the big I there, isn't it? This Eliphaz is saying, I don't condemn you, no, I'm, I'm, I'm self-righteous, I'm righteous here, but it's you condemn yourself or your own, you know. That is real self-righteousness right there, isn't it? Verse 6. <laughs> uh yeah something else stood out to me too as you read that your own mouth condemns you can you think of somebody that said that to jesus oh, it's the Pharisees. yeah that's that's what they said at jesus's trial uh, just when they found him guilty the the high priest caiaphas He's, he's, he said, I adjure you by the living God. Are you are you the, 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 the Christ? And, and Jesus said, yes. And he said, by your own words, condemn you. And he tore his, tore his robe as a sign of, that's blasphemy. It's worthy of death. So um, that's why. Now, people have all kinds of explanations of why Jesus was tried and, and condemned and crucified. And, uh, you know, they... Some people think it was for political reasons and, and began because of our, uh, you know, the, the Jews want to save the, themselves from uh, Rome coming against the a political uh, upheaval. Uh, but really, the, the real reason is, is stated right there. And that is that he claimed that he was the Christ, the Son of God. He, because he claimed to be God, Christ, the Son of God, uh, that's why they condemned him. Exactly. 
exactly. All right. Um, Maybe we need to we need to rename we need to rename Miss Caiaphas, really, don't we? Rename what? We need to rename Job's friends Eliphaz as Caiaphas, perhaps. <laughs> Well, it certainly, certainly are acting an awful like the Pharisees of, of uh, Jesus' time. I'll, give, I'll say that about them. Um, so they're, they're, they're saying, well, you think you know it all? Well, what about us? We know as much as you, is what that, to sum up this whole thing that they're, they're saying. You think you're, you're the only one smart? We're just as smart as you. And then in verse uh, uh, verse 10, he says, uh, among us are both the gray-haired and the aged, older than your father. <laughs> there you go. There goes the derision again. So we, we, we can glean from that that Job was younger than all, you know, that Eddie Faz and his relations, the gray hairs that are still around. And, and they're now belittling the poor man. You know, he's had enough trouble, and now they're belittling him on top of it. Yeah, and that actually... Uh, that is interesting. I mean, I, I before this verse uh, right now, uh, I never, never really noticed that before. Uh, I, I always thought Job was older than these guys. These guys are like young punks coming there to, you know, uh, criticize this wise old Job, you know. But now that I'm thinking about it, remember, you know, he has many years ahead of him to recover his all his property and his wealth and all that and, it, and a new family and so many years pass so he had to be um pretty young when all this happened compared to uh, you know he wasn't an old man near the end of his days i hadn't really dawned on me before okay let's go with the uh verse 11 are the consolations of god as we have interpreted them to you too trivial for you or or were we too gentle toward you in our first speech to be effective <laughs> oh, <didn't we? laughs> too gentle. first speech was bad and now the second speech is bad oh man it's amazing yeah that is amazing that they would think that uh yeah they they hadn't hammered him enough they hadn't like belittled him condemned him enough uh and, and now we didn't get through. We have to even call you even worse names to so you'll understand. Verse 12, why does your heart carry you away, allowing you to be controlled by emotion? And why do your eyes flash in anger or contempt that you should turn your spirit against God and let such words as you have spoken go out of your mouth? What is man that he should be pure and clean, or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous and just? Well, let's let's go just for the, to, through verse uh, thirteen here. Uh, uh, why do your eyes flash in anger? And he's he, where are you getting all emotional and angry? Uh, <laughs> We'll make me laugh about that. You know, his whole family's been wiped out. He's lost absolutely everything. And, and these patronizing and Pharisees are saying to him, why are you getting upset about it? Well, perhaps because all my kids have been killed and I've lost everything. Oh, dear me. They're, very not, they're, they're not really full of empathy, these people. No, it's, uh, you're right. I mean, the we, we, we use Job, the, this whole story, to give us perspective in our lives so that when we have troubles, we can compare it to Job and say, oh, my troubles don't compare to that. I mean, who who could say, as, as many troubles as I've had in my life, nothing has risen to the level of Job's troubles. And most people throughout history would have to admit the same thing. I mean, there are some people that probably had troubles as bad as Job now, but, but for the vast majority of us, whatever our troubles are, they don't rise to the, quite that level, and we and we get perspective, and we also see that Job continued to love God and have faith, and and um, so it gives us um, an example and perspective, and yet 
even though all this horrible things have happened to Job, now they're piling on and just criticizing, condemning him, and making making it even worse. They're, they're certainly not helping the situation. They're just making him feel even worse. I could imagine if 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 I was suffering, uh, and, and then I had friends that just wanted to blame it all on me and treat me the way that they're treating Job. I mean, yeah, would I get angry? You know, I I, I don't know how I could not be getting angry about it. Yeah, and I've got to be honest with you. You know, Job was being very restrained and very patient with his friends. Because I've got to be honest, if that was my <coughs> friends and all my kids were killed, I lost absolutely everything and they start blaming me for it. I've got to be honest, they'd be out of the house and it would, they'd be having busted jaws and black eyes. I wouldn't be just sitting there. So he's a real good inspirational character in regard to patience, I'll tell you. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll read this uh, uh, verse 14, 15, and 16. It says, What is man that he should be pure and clean, or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous and just? And that contradicts what Job was saying. He, he said that God put my sins up in a bag and sewed it shut, <laughs> you know? And so they're, they're saying that's... Uh, that's not right. And we do know that the scriptures tell us that everyone is a sinner. And because of sin, we're estranged from God. But we also know that because of our faith in God, particularly now, this Savior God, Jesus Christ, uh, we know that our sins are put up in a bag. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west. Our sins and iniquities, he will remember no more. So uh, it is true that Everyone's a sinner, but it's also true that God uh, is merciful and and uh, he He wants all of us to have salvation. He offers it to everyone. So um, they're only they're only looking at this one side of it. They're they're either ignorant or omitting the fact that yeah, everybody's a sinner, and yet if we put faith in God, He puts our sins in the back. Well, yeah, that's certainly admitting that, omitting that, you know, that, 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 that was very spiritual of Job to say that. And, and they haven't, like I said, it's gone way over the head. They haven't grasped, you know, actually, you know, even in Job's suffering, you know, that the groanings of his heart, especially when he's speaking in spiritual terms, are weighing above even, you know, what they comprehend at this moment. Yeah, um, it's. I love these a uh, contrast verse. Uh, there's a couple of contrast verses that are really uh, so clear. Uh, Romans uh, 3:23. No, Romans 6:23. Uh, the wage of sin is death, but and here's the here's a use of the word but that it is helpful to us. <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see the contrast of, yeah, man is corrupt. We're all sinners. We'll all die. Well, and, and uh, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We So we see this contrast. And, and what they're failing to do is, is see the contrast. That, and um, Job understands that. And another contrast verse, of course, is uh, uh, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We have another application of the word but that's an appropriate use of it. Rather than perishing, we will have eternal life if we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, so uh, that probably leads us to a, a good point to... Um, get into our, our closing remarks about this and also the uh, uh, salvation message, the the uh, invitation for salvation here. So, so let me ask you now, I'm going to make a note here that, uh, uh, let me see, verse 15, what is that? Uh, we'll pick up with verse 15 next time. Let me make a note of that. 
Job uh, chapter 15, verse 15, next time. Um, so for now, since I, I gave you a couple of verses and examples to the, the contrast, the situation, and uh, I mean, some people think that everybody gets to go to heaven. And, and uh, it's, it's really, really sad that, uh, I mean, for some reason, every time there's a funeral, unless someone is just like one of the most horrible people in the world, you know, then, then people might say, well, that person's in hell. But pretty much everybody else, we think, the world thinks, well, they're going to go to heaven. We'll see them again in heaven. They don't understand that, no, there are some people that don't go to heaven. In fact, most people. According to Jesus, wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many go that way. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few go that way. So a few go into life everlasting, and many, or most, go into destruction. And uh, so there is a there, there are clear verses that say there are two groups of people. Not everybody gets to go to heaven. And there is a distinction. There is a dividing line. And that dividing line is Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus? So, Brother Bill, I want you to tell anybody who's watching this now, uh, this elaborate more on this contrast between these two groups of people and what, what determines how you're in one group that goes to destruction or the other group that goes into life everlasting. Well, yeah, yeah. To be honest, you know, in society, people break themselves up in a whole plethora of groups, thousands, even millions. But in truth, there's only two groups. There's only saved or unsaved. And the, the, the difference between the two groups is the cross. It's Christ Jesus. So if you imagine a cross there, left of the cross are those who, who, who don't put their faith and trust in this Jesus Christ. And right of the cross are those who do put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. You know, it's been amazing this evening, and I do hope and pray that people have listened to it, because there's, there's a lot of spiritual truth in what we've been reading from, from Job. You know, Job is describing, without even realising probably, you know, describing Christ, his death and his resurrection. He's describing the atonement. Now, these might be big words for, for people who don't understand, but in, in simple terms, the, the crux of it is that that we're all sinners. Every single creature on this earth is a sinner. And sin just basically means to miss the mark. Now, God, God has set a level, because he's holy, he's perfect, utterly sinless, and, and he's only full of love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, and perfection. You know, and, and he sets a level, so if you want to see him face to face, and to be with God in all eternity, we have to reach this level. And our best day, you know, as we've read in here, Eliphaz thought he was righteous. Well, these people thought they were righteous, but even on their best day, you know, they'd be lacking to get there. If you're an apostle, you might just notch up just one or two. But in all seriousness, it doesn't matter how far up you notch it within self, it won't reach Christ's perfection. You know, and the word declares, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. And, and the problem with this sin is, you know, the word says, for the wages of sin is death. And death, you know, however you want to describe it with a lake of fire or separation from God, whatever this death is, the second death, it is separation from a loving God. You will never see God face to face. You will never encounter his love, and you will never be in, in an eternal paradise or bliss with him. All right? But despite this, despite our humanity and our, and our wretchedness and, and the ways of sin being death, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And this is what we implore you to do today, is to believe on this Christ Jesus. Now, Jesus came to earth. You know, most people, you know, especially in the Western world, know of, you know, the stories of, you know, of Christmas time and stuff like that and how nice it is and they even celebrate Christmas. Jesus came to earth for a purpose. You know, it wasn't so he could just stay as a babe in a manger and so that 2,000 years later we can open up presents and celebrate it. Now, this whole point of this, this is Jesus is God, don't forget. 
current of worth was to die that we may live that he would lay down his life for us all right that we may live and that was his whole purpose he came uh, you know to, to earth to die and make payment for all our sin all our fallen short where we couldn't get to this mark jesus could get to this mark because jesus was god and if we believe on this jesus who died for us and made payment for all our wrongs and all our shortcomings if we was to believe on that you know our, our level because we'd be if the words imputed but we would be imputed with his righteousness his goodness and all that he is and we'd be brought up to this level and by doing so that we, we could see god face to face and be in eternity with him in paradise it's not really complicated to to, to be saved religiality may complicate it and tell you to go through you know hoops and do somersaults and repent of this and do penance and and pay your mint a tithe and obey the command and you've got to do all manner of things in religiosity but what god requires what jesus spoke on and what the bible is clear on all we need to do is believe on jesus christ we just need to have faith or trust in him and, and that is as simple as that you know if you was today wish to put your trust in jesus christ you would you would be imputed with his righteousness you would see god face to face and you will be in paradise forever it's not hard it really isn't and faith is just just literally putting your trust in him you know if if my father says to me right here's a cup of tea grab it and i grab it and take the cup of tea that's that's faith <laughs> because my father has said he's given it me i believed him and i've took it and that's the same with eternal life and the gift that he's offering jesus says you know verily verily which is definitely definitely he that believe on me hath that's present tense eternal life that's simple christ is offering you now eternal life all you've got to do is receive it unto yourself that is as simple as it gets and i just will use one scenario in the bible because I think it's the best scenario in the whole Bible. And in actual fact, it's the only scenario in the Bible where someone actually asks a direct question and a direct answer is given. And that is a, the story of a Philippine jailer. Now, this jailer was, you know, the apostle was put in a, in a prison. This is Paul and Silas. And there was an earthquake. And as the earthquake shook, you know, it, it broke that their chains of all the prisoners. It wasn't just them in the prison. There was many other prisoners, and it broke their chains. And, and you know, the the prison doors were broken open, and they could escape any time. And that, you know, under under Roman law in them days, if if you was in charge of the prisons, if any of your prisoners escaped, you know, you were sentenced to death. You know, and this happened. So you can imagine the scenario. This sh the prison shook. All these people were chains were loose. They could have run out. And, and the Philippine jailer, he was just about to kill himself because he didn't want to be put to death under the Roman judicial system. So he'd rather take his own life. But Paul and Silas said, uh, you know, came up to him and said, don't kill yourself. We're all here. And no one's escaping. No one's doing anything. We're all here. I'm paraphrasing here. I'm not going verbatim. I'm just paraphrasing here. And, and he noticed this. And he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And, they, and so that was the question. And the answer was simple. And they just said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's how simple it is for somebody to be saved this day. You don't need religiosity. You don't need to jump through hoops. You've got to believe on this Jesus Christ, who is in essence our salvation. And not only ours, he's the saviour of the whole world. So I pray that you would, you would believe on this Jesus Christ. Call out to him. Know it in your heart that you're a sinner and you've fallen short. And if you're honest, you'd know that. You might pretend to put on a face or a facade that you're not, but deep down, search your own heart, search your own conscience, search your own spirit. You're a sinner and you know it. And you need to just realize that, know that you can't save yourself, but call upon this Jesus Christ, Son of God, who can save you and is there and waiting for you to call on this day you know really that simple know that jesus loves you so much that he died for you to make payment for your sins 
It was buried for you. And he rose again, you know, in resurrection power, the third day, proven that not only did he have power over death, that he had power over life. He had power over all things to raise himself from the dead. And if we was to believe on those facts and in him, you know, that same power that rose Christ from the dead, all right, will reside in you this day. So come the great and glorious day, you know, when you fall asleep, but you'll be awakened immediately in the presence of God in resurrection power. Put your faith and trust in this Christ today and be my brother, be Luke's brother, and be amongst the, you know, the greatest and most blessed family in this whole entire universe. And that is the family of God, the body of Christ, sons and daughters together. So I pray that and urge you now, put your trust in this Jesus now. Amen. Okay, Brother Bill, thank you so much. Uh, I, I just want to close by saying that uh, if, want to thank everybody for watching today. Uh, I, I hope you'll join us every Wednesday and Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Wednesdays, we're going through the book of Proverbs, and Sundays, uh, we're doing these character studies, and it'll be quite some time. We'll continue studying Job until we're finished. Uh, so please join us every Wednesday and Sunday, and the final thing is, if, if you actually will do what Brother Bill said you must do, please make a comment on this video and let us know. And he said, there's one thing you must do. If you want to go to heaven, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Bless you. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.